The other day, I had the honor of having Professor Hayam Bereshit on our program. Professor Hayam Bereshit is an internationally renowned author, filmmaker, photographer, and film study scholar and activist. He has written and edited a number of books, including the best-selling Introduction to the Holocaust, The Gulf War and the New World Order, Cinema and Memory, A Dangerous Liaison, and The Conflict and Contemporary Visual Culture in Palestine and Israel. He was on editorial board of the critically acclaimed journal Hamsin, and among his films are State of Danger, a documentary on the first Palestinian Intifada, and London Burning, a documentary on the summer riot in London in 2011. Today I have a great honor to have uh, Professor Hayam Breshid with us. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. I would like to begin with the horrific events that we've been witnessing last few weeks in Gaza borders. More than 12,000 people injured, many crippled for life, using banned ammunition, so-called butterfly bullets, uh, exploding bullets, targeting medical personnel, uh, 19 of them just on Monday, one of them killed. More than 110 people, unarmed people, killed, babies, children, people on uh, wheelchairs. The media, of course, they have um, framed this uh, merely as a response to Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which, of course, ignores the century-long struggle by Palestinians. Could you give us some historic context on uh, this new wave of struggle for Palestinians? Now, the first thing to remember is that of the two million um, Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip, um, most of them are actually refugees from the rest of Palestine. Uh, they have uh, been there since 1948. Um, they are protected by um, a UN uh, series of uh, resolutions that enshrines their right to return to their home and lands. Uh, Israel has never accepted this and did not allow them to return. Um, so first of all, the uh, march uh, was the, the, the six-week action and the march um, towards um, the, the border is uh, called Al-Auda, uh, meaning the return march. And um, this is about re returning to uh, Palestine. So first of all, uh, it is not just the embassy which is a problem. The embassy became the focal point because uh, this is a change in American policy from since 1948. Uh, but it is basically about the right to return to their homes in Palestine. Why did they do it now? Because uh, for many years, um, they are, for 11 years, they are under blockade by Israel. And uh, the UN is now telling us that by 2020, that is in less than two years, life will not be possible in Gaza because uh, the water is not clean and Israel does not allow them enough electricity to operate uh, properly um, plants that um, clean the water. Um, the electricity, electricity supply is not safe. The food um, and medicine are uh, allowed in um, and very, very, um, very little is allowed in on a calorie count that Israel is instigated, which the Nazis uh, have used, you know. So basically, life is becoming impossible. It is impossible to come in. It, it is impossible to go out. People cannot go to study abroad or even in the rest of Palestine. Now, this is totally illegal. But the main thing that is that it is impossible for the Palestinians to continue in this situation. And they have received no support um, from the rest of the world, not even from the Arab world. So um, they have... Um, they obviously think that this cannot continue and they do not want to continue. In many interviews that were published in Hebrew in the last few uh, days, 
uh, Palestinians are saying, um, if we have to die, let us die um, like this, um, standing up and fighting, rather than um, die like rats in, in, in a hole. Uh, Gaza is basically an open prison, the largest prison on earth with two million people um, not allowed to leave and not allowed to, li to, to live. So um, they are not allowed to, to, to live. They are, um, prefer to, uh, to stand up. And Israel doesn't have a solution for this. They don't want the um, Gaza people there, but they are not going to go anywhere. They are actually standing up. This is called a sumud. They are not doing what their fathers and grandfathers did in 1948. They are not leaving. And of course, they have nowhere to leave, even if they wanted to, which they don't. So there is a situation that Israel doesn't have a solution to, but it hopes that by um, probably instigating a war in the Middle East, which is it is planning to have with Iran, and probably Hezbollah in Lebanon, they will create a situation where they can push millions of Palestinians out of Palestine and complete the Nakba. Now, I think this is totally mad, uh, but that has never stopped the Israelis in the past. They have done mad things, and they will continue to do mad things. So, um, here we have two um, uh, communities, one which is um, a settler um, colonial community, the Israelis, with the strongest army in the Middle East, who are trying to push the original indigenous community of Palestinians totally out of Palestine. This is, um, um, you know, basically a zero-sum game. Uh, they are going for broke, and they are doing that because they don't know how long Trump is going to be in the White House. Nobody knows that. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, you know, there is no certainty there. As long as Trump is there, they can get what they want. Uh, so um, the, to the clock is ticking for them. Uh, and that's why they are doing things faster than they did before. Um, it's also important to remember that if indeed Trump goes to Korea, um, which is an if now, but mm -hmm. if he goes and if there is a, a signed agreement, uh, which obviously is trying to get, um, there will be um, one enemy left for uh, the United States, uh, which is Iran. And this has been the Netanyahu um, agenda since um, his first government in the 1990s. Actually, before he became prime minister, Iran was already his main um, target when he was in the UN as the Israeli ambassador to the UN. So he invented Iran as the great enemy of the United of uh, Israel, and also sold this enemy to the United States. Now, Iran is obviously a, a strong country, a modern country, but it is not an enemy of the United States. It's nonsensical to think about Iran as an enemy of the United States. And um, basically, um, for many years, uh, the American didn't buy this. But with the right-wing governments in the United States, they have bought into the Israeli agenda more and more. And Trump, of course, having no serious agenda of his own, is actually adopting this lock, stock, and barrel. So I think this is what they are now building their hopes on. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is mad and that, um, you know, it, we have here... Um, global interest, we have here um, nuclear bombs involved. Um, Israel is, um, is telling the rest of the world that Iran is dangerous because it's building a bomb. Well, first of all, it's clear that Iran is not building a bomb. Even the Americans admitted that. And secondly, um, Israel is the one that has nuclear bombs, not Iran. So if there is a danger, for a nuclear war in the Middle East, it doesn't come from Iran, it comes from Israel. And Israel is not controlled in any way 
um, either by the international community or by its um, sponsors, the United States and Europe and so on. So um, this is what the Israelis are now building on. Um, they are hoping that they will be able to create a situation where they will get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. And actually, they are saying this every day, not probably Netanyahu, but ministers in his government. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned U.S. and uh, you, you remember in 2003, one of, the, one of George Bush's senior advisor said uh, anyone can go to Baghdad, but real men go to Tehran. Back then, they were talking about the new American century and new Middle East and uh, the grand design for Middle East. Uh, of course, the fiasco in Afghanistan and Iraq and what followed later in Libya and Syria put a halt uh, to this uh, grand design. But do you think, uh, considering what we're seeing now, the, moving the U U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, the constant uh, threats of war and regime change in Iran, uh, do you think that, uh, considering all that, and the, the return of people like uh, John Bolton and Gina Haspel as senior officials to American uh, administration, are we witnessing a revival of the, this uh, old uh, policy? I mean, what do you think about that? I'm sure this is a revival of the old policy. I mean, basically, there's a number of levels, and I'll try and be brief. I mean, first of all, the policy is based on, um, in a sense, inflaming hatred between Sunnis and Shia. Um, and because Iran is the largest Shia country, uh, and because Saudi Arabia, the other um, part of the triangle of US, Israel, and, and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is basically um, behind a lot of uh, the Wahhabi extremists, as, as we know. Um, um, from Al-Qaeda to ISIL, um, they're all coming from Saudi Arabia. These are Wahhabi extremists. Um, we also know now that um, it, as part of the revived plan, as you call it, um, ISIS or ISIL, whatever you call it, is actually supported by Israel uh, because um, the Americans uh, can't support it openly, so they use Israel as, um, as a way of supporting it. And it has American and Israeli arms. Uh, so uh, what the Americans are trying to do is to build, uh, well, they have done it already, to build an anti-Shia, anti-Iran front across the Middle East. Um, it's not that successful, but it hasn't failed yet. Um, so... Um, this, of course, is also an Israeli um, uh, objective uh, because Israel wants um, continued conflict in the Middle East. Nothing else will serve its purposes. And as I said before, one of the reasons why this conflict might um, play into the hands is that they want to get rid of the Palestinians and they create a situation a bit like in Burma where you know, they get rid of, you know, the Burmese got rid of, um, you know, um, half a million Rohingya, and uh, the world did nothing. for uh, Israel has um, advised uh, this uh, genocide and, and ethnic cleansing and um, sent um, people there as well as arms uh, because it has an interest in this as, as, um, as a political laboratory. If the situation in, of the Rohingya remains as it is, in other words, they remain in Bangladesh, then um, the same will be true if Israel gets rid of Palestinians in great numbers. Um, the other thing is, we have to remember that Gaza is the largest, not just the largest prison, but the largest lab, war lab, or, you know, uh, armaments laboratory. Uh, Everything, uh, you talked about the new um, illegal and inhuman um, armaments, like the exploding bullets, they are trying gases that nobody has ever heard of uh, in Gaza. They are trying um, every possible new technology um, against the Palestinians. 
Uh, this then is uh, the basis of um, selling um, armaments to the whole world, both for um, you know ar the armies and for security services, police, and so on. And this is really the heart of the Israeli economy. So um, that's why conflict is really necessary, both for America and for Israel, because their economies depend on it. And the other thing is uh, we need to remember is that um, Israel failed in 2006 to do what the Americans wanted. The Americans wanted it. And they admitted it. Uh, I can read you a few lines from Charles Krauthammer, who is um, probably at the time the number one political commentator. And he wrote in the um, Washington Times uh, after Israel failed the, um, the war, they failed to defeat Hezbollah. Uh, the defeat of Hezbollah would be a huge loss for Iran both psychologically and strategically. Iran would lose its foothold in Lebanon. It would lose its major means to destabilize and inject itself into the heart of the Middle East. This could have been written today, yeah? Mm -hmm. It would be shown to have vastly overreached in trying to establish itself as the regional superpower. The United States has gone far out on a limb to allow Israel to win and for all this to happen, meaning the war in 2006. It has counted on Israel's ability to do the job. It has been disappointed. So, you know, they admit that they sent Israel into Lebanon to defeat Hezbollah as a proxy of Iran, and they failed. Um, so they have to try again, and they don't give up. You know, obviously Obama didn't want to do that, but Trump has gone back to the plan before Obama of um, the new American century uh, of controlling um, the Middle East via Israel and Saudi Arabia. And this is a very interesting partnership because the partnership works uh, not that the Americans drive Israel and Saudi Arabia or that Israel and Saudi Arabia drive America, but that they actually uh, synchronize their aims very closely. Um, so that um, I, I can't describe it as if, you know, America is the imperial power, which of course it is, and therefore it gives orders to Israel to do this and to do that. It doesn't work like that. It's a, it's a much closer um, partnership than giving orders. It doesn't give orders. Basically, sometimes it looks like Netanyahu is giving the orders. No. So this is a, a complex relationship that works for those three countries, or they think it works, and until now, they are sure it works. Uh, but actually, Iran has not been defeated. Um, the uh, Hezbollah has not been defeated. The Shias uh, now winning elections in Iraq, as you know. So actually, um, and actually more um, extreme, if you want, uh, or more radical as uh, she is, are now uh, coming to the fore. So um, the, um, the, the objective of separating Sunni from Shia has failed. Um, it failed beautifully in Lebanon, um, because after 2006, not only was Hezbollah was uh, was Hezbollah was not defeated, it became stronger. Uh, it came to be supported by Sunni and Christians and the Druze. Uh, it became the most important organization, um, political organization in the Middle East, and Nasrallah became almost as. Um, uh, revered as Nasser at the time, uh, because he is the one that stands firm and uh, and fights Israel. He's also uh, not corrupt, um, like you know some of the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah are, and therefore he is uh, standing um, tall as uh, an Arab leader, not just as a Shia or South Lebanese leader, but he is a political leader of um, the Arab people. 
so this is um, this failure um, has delayed for a few years because of Obama's presidency the attacks um, on um, on Iran via its proxy, but and also attacks on Iran itself. Uh, now we're coming back to this agenda, as you pointed out. Yeah. And now, of course, all of this is playing in hands of the Iranian regime. They, they would love to have these kind of conflicts because it gives them a little more open hand uh, to, to do whatever they want in Iran. So you think it's a common interest for Iranian people and Palestinian people, Israeli people, and all the people in the Middle East in uh, pursuing democracy and uh, freedom for all the people in the in this region. It's very clear that Israel and Iran have become um, societies of a similar nature in the sense that religion is playing the center role in um, bringing people together, supposedly, and oppressing them into supporting the regime. Um, you know, Israel is criticizing Iran as a theocracy, but Israel itself is a theocracy. Mm -hmm. So it's in a sense, the Saudi Arabia. It's interesting that uh, Hezbollah is not asking for an Islamic state in Lebanon. No. It accepts uh, multicultural Lebanon and supports it. But Iran is not, um, you know, um, a democratic country. Israel is not a democratic country. Um, and of course, Saudi Arabia never was a democratic country. So these three um, have got a lot in common. It doesn't matter that some are Shia and some are Jewish, <laughs> you know, these differences are less important. What is important is that the three different religions are used by uh, the three different regimes for a very similar purpose, and that is controlling the people through continuous wars. So yes, you know, all the people in the Middle East have a very um, urgent need for democracy, first of all the Palestinians. And um, just to remind you that um, you know, of course, that Hamas in Gaza has been elected in the only elections ever in the Palestinian, authority, uh, Palestinian um, areas, uh, it was elected and, and won the Palestinian elections. And since then, we didn't have elections because um, you know, the PN, uh, P, PNA doesn't want to, to lose again, which they will. Now, the people that won uh, this election for Hamas were not the Islamists. Uh, actually, people in Ramallah, in the West Bank, voted for Hamas because it was not a corrupt organization like uh, the PLO was. So, um, in a sense, we have here an interesting situation where um, two movements were supposedly Islamist are actually not corrupt or not as corrupt as um, the uh, secular leaders um, in Palestine or in Lebanon and that the three governments, uh, Iran, Israel and Saudi Arabia, are using religion and nationalism to control um, the populations and to drive to war because uh, this is in the interest of the government but not in the interest of people of course. So there is a lot that should hold together uh, the people of Iran, the people of Palestine and the people of Israel um, if they want uh, a just peace uh, in the Middle East which I'm sure most of them do. Uh, but the governments don't allow that, and they use religion, they use all kinds of, and they use war um, to, to control their peoples. Professor Haim Breshet is an internationally renowned author, filmmaker, photographer, and film study scholar and activist. I thank you so much for your time, and I hope that uh, we could have you again on our program. Thank you very much.